Hello and welcome to the dark side. So this, um, um, I don't know why you, you're watching this video. You might be watching it because you're in a biblical interpretation class with me at Houghton College. Um, this follows, as you know, if you're in that class, upon a, uh, a class session, two hour class session, in which we talked about the genres of the Old Testament. And that session was meant to focus on what is really important, uh, the things that are most helpful, uh, and also the things that are most uh, applicational. How do we apply um, the Old Testament in relation to the genres? How do the genres uh, provide a kind of lens through which we might know how to apply the law or narrative or poetry uh, and, and psalms and so forth? Now, now for the second half of the lecture, uh, which is more about um, kind of what scholars say the darndest things, you know, or, or what are they saying at Harvard and Yale about, uh, or what did they used to say? Um, um, I won't go into some other kind of postmodern stuff, but um, what are the critical concerns or what are some of the issues that have been brought out over the last 150 years or so um, in various scholarly circles? Things that you probably should have heard of. Um, and I don't want to, I mean, I, I'm kind of playing light with it. Um, I think when I was in college, uh, I kind of, uh, those stupid liberals, you know, I kind of, I kind of mocked these things, you know, when I was in seminary, of course, uh, I went to Asbury Seminary, which is a conservative seminary, you know, so um, they exposed us to these various theories. Um, you know, I think my takeaway from Asbury was um, these aren't necessarily, <laughs> you're not necessarily evil if you take these seriously. In fact, the, the, the more I dug into them, the more I understood, okay, I, I completely understand where that's coming from. Um, I don't think that uh, you're going to go to uh, hell if you uh, buy into some of these things. Um, they're probably not on the, the priority list of things to know as a Christian about uh, the Bible. There's my preface. And now some of the critical issues of the Old Testament. Well, let's start with the Pentateuch. So um, in the late 1800s, um, actually before then, but it, it really kind of reached its, its earliest kind of mature form um, in relation to the sources, uh, potential sources behind Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The theory was put forth by a guy named Julius or Julius Wellhausen. Uh, it's spelled Julius Wellhausen if you're uh, looking at it from an English lens. But in German, it's Julius Wellhausen, uh, who was at Tübingen in Germany. And um, he basically, again, he didn't come up with all the pieces, but he put it together and put it together in a form that was uh, experienced as hostile to faith. You know, so it left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. I personally don't think um, where I'm at today that the idea that there might be various sources behind Genesis, for example, I don't particularly find that an, uh, a hostile to faith idea in itself. Certainly, Bellhausen used it in a way that was hostile to orthodoxy. But the idea here is, is that there are layers of sources behind Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, and for example, if you take the flood story, um, I did this once for fun because I, I'm a nerd. Um, if you take the verses that use Yahweh in them, and you take the verses that use Elohim in them, you can almost line up two different stories. Now, I don't know why somebody would splice together two different versions of the same story, but there are these, what we might call doublets, I don't know whether that's the right word, in Genesis. Um, I, I actually preached uh, Sunday on, on Jacob and Esau. And um, because of my background, uh, part of the Jacob and Esau story is there is an event where um, Esau comes in from hunting and Jacob's ready with some stew and Jacob twists, uh, gets the birthright of Esau out of him with the stew. Ah, Esau's lost his birthright. Well, then there's this other story where um, Esau, Isaac has Esau go hunting 
And while Esau's off hunting, Jacob tricks his dad into giving him the blessing. And so we have these two stories that are kind of parallel to each other. And I've always, I've always kind of thought, no, wait a minute, what's the difference between a birthright and a blessing? Are these kind of the same thing? And um, as I was preparing my sermon, of course, I certainly didn't mention this in the sermon, um, but I, I was thinking to myself, ah, I bet, uh, I bet Wellhausen would, Wellhausen would say that these are the same story, um, but one is in the J source and one is in the E source. The J source would be the source that uses Yahweh and the E source would be the source that uses Elohim. Now, I didn't actually look this up. I am now going to see if this hypothesis has any water at all, okay? I am now going to go to Genesis and come back and tell you whether the one version with the blessing and the other version with the birthright, whether different names for God are used. So we're, we're testing Wellhausen's hypothesis right now as we speak. Hold that thought. Okay, I'm back. So it's indeterminate. Um, the story of the blessing does use Elohim, uh, as I can see. Um, although Yahweh is used in that story as well. Um, in verse uh, chapter 27, verse 27, uh, Yahweh is, is there, uh, but most of the story uses Elohim, it looks to me. Uh, for example, in verse, no, it has Yahweh's, okay, it's a Yahweh. Okay, I take it back. This is a Yahweh passage. Um, it's, it's uh, Yahweh is used throughout chapter 27. Now, when I go back to chapter 25, it, the birthright story doesn't name God. So that's why I say it's indeterminate. We don't have the word Elohim uh, in those verses. No, no reference is made. So it's indeterminate. The, it neither proves nor disproves the, the theory. Um, but anyway, Wellhausen, I'm sure if you were to go back and read Wellhausen's work, he would say that the birthright story belongs to the Elohim layer, the E layer, and the uh, blessing story belongs to the Yahweh layer. Anyway, that's the theory, JDP. The D stands for, so the idea is, is that there are these two versions of the story of Genesis and Israel. Um, one used Yahweh, the other used Elohim, and that these two got spliced together at some point and became a common story. And then at some point, Deuteronomy got added. Uh, that's what the D stands for. And then the, some priestly editor edited the whole thing together. Um, um, if you ever read Josh McDowell's New Evidence That Demands a Verdict, uh, his, his book, New Evidence That Demands a Verdict, I think primarily trashes JDP. Um, is this ungodly? It could be used ungodly in an ungodly way. Certainly could be used in an ungodly way. Um, I'm not sure that, again, you, this, is, this is Trivial Pursuit Night. Um, I'm not sure that you, uh, that it's that important of an issue one way or the other. But okay, this has been uh, critical concerns in the Pentateuch JEDP. The, the theory has gone on, you know, I think the current consensus is that there was no E. Um, I think maybe E and P have been collapsed together. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm not an expert on it. Um, the, by the way, the, the branch of biblical studies that looks into sources is called source criticism. So source criticism of the Old Testament would ask these questions about sources behind the Pentateuch. Source criticism of the New Testament would ask which gospel was first, which gospel used, which gospel is a source. So in, in normally um, in uh, source criticism in the New Testament, they would say that Mark was the first of the gospels to be written and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source. Some would say that they also used another source, Q. Okay, uh, you've had enough. There was also in the early 1900s, uh, the rise of what was called form criticism. And form criticism uh, aimed at um, looking for signs of oral tradition. Now, I would say that most of the early form critics uh, didn't understand oral uh, orality very well. I think there've been um, great discoveries in orality uh, in the late 20th century, Walter Ong, for example. Um, and, and even in the, 
in the 21st century, I think there's been some great work uh, done on oral tradition. When you look back at some of the early stuff, uh, it looks pretty uh, amateurish, I would say, um, when, you, when you look at recent studies. So for example, you may have heard the whole telephone game idea, you know, that the gospel writers were decades away from, uh, or that Jesus was decades before the gospel writers, so they probably messed up their memory. Well, oral tradition is pretty reliable with the core of historical memory. Um, the telephone game doesn't work uh, as an explanation of ancient oral tradition. Um, my own doctor father, James Dunn, uh, in his book, uh, Jesus Remembered, and he has a shorter version of it, A New Perspective on Jesus or something like that. I can't remember the name of the shorter book, but he talks about how oral traditions about Jesus would have started while Jesus was alive. Um, it, they didn't just wait 30 years to say, oh, we better write this down before we forget it. Um, oral traditions were persistent in an oral culture. Um, so lots of, lots of advances in our understanding of orality, I think, in recent years. Form criticism said uh, there were certain forms of traditions and um, we can, they tried to identify the, the, the Sitzemleben, the situations in life in which various parables, for example, would have been spoken. Um, a lot of that, I think, was amateurish. Um, if, if you're in the course I'm teaching, I mentioned even tonight that the psalm, psalmist didn't come with a rule book that said, oh, you can't mix imprecatory with lament with praise. You can't do that. The rule book says you've got to stick with your type. And in the same way, I think some of the personalities of form criticism were just, they just weren't the ancients could do whatever they wanted with genre. Uh, and so we're not going to follow your rules. There was a famous guy with the parables. What was his name? Um, it's going to drive me nuts. So let me pause to remember and take a sip of coffee. Adolf Ulicker, you know, a parable can only have one point. Who says? Who made up that rule? And here's where I make, I, you know, Shank is, is uh, sounds German at least. I do have some German in me. It's, it's actually not from the Shank, but, but, um, uh, so I can make fun of the Germans, right? Since I have German in me, you know, this is one of the problems with this German scholarship is it's, it's like, it has to be this way. Everything has to be categorized. You know, who says, <laughs> this is the British in me speaking, nuts. Anyway, or maybe it's the American. But um, so uh, I, I just, the early, there was good stuff too in there. I mean, you can find good in it, but I think a lot of the the early German form criticism stuff wasn't wasn't as sharp as it could have been, but but here's here would be an example of form criticism. And I'm sorry, this sounds this is anyway just you know go la 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 la. But um, you, you have three versions of a story where Abraham, well, a man, a woman, and a, another person uh, are involved. It's either Abraham, Isaac, and Pharaoh. I'm sorry, it's either Abraham, Sarah and Pharaoh, or it's Abraham, Sarah, and Abimelech, or it's Isaac, Rebekah, and uh, Abimelech. And these are all where uh, Abraham or Isaac says, it's my sister, it's not my wife, and then God judges the, the other person, you know, and the other person's like, why did you lie to me? Um, and what, what form criticism would say is that this is the same, these are three versions of the same story. And that the most, the most, the root story is probably Isaac, Rebecca, and Abimelech, because those are the least famous of the characters. So that oral tradition will gravitate toward the more famous. So from Abimelech to Pharaoh, who's more famous, or from uh, Isaac and Rebecca to Abraham and Sarah, who are um, more famous. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, I believe you you will find here. Let me just do a quick double check in terms of uh, one of the Abraham Sarah stories uses Yahweh and the other Abraham Sarah story uses uh, Elohim. Pause. Yes. So in Genesis 12, uh, 17, it's Yahweh, Abram, Sarai, and Pharaoh. And then in um, chapter 20, it's Abraham, Sarah and Abimelech, and it's Elohim. Um, so anyway, do whatever you want with that or do nothing with it. Um, again, oral tradition, we would expect to do that sort of thing. The question is, 
can can Genesis be inspired and have that kind of variety? And some would say, no, uh, if you believe Genesis inspired, then you have you have to reject this theory. And others would say um, that the inspiration of the story is not about that sort of thing, that that's just not, that's, that's irrelevant to the question. The question is what is true about the story? Um, not, uh, not his, history is not the, the criterion for truthfulness, uh, the other side would say. I'll leave that with, with you um, to, to wrestle with. Um, so that's form criticism, how the shape of oral tradition. Um, in the 1970s, um, you know, the younger generation, they're, they're all very old now, uh, but in the 1970s, that generation of scholars got tired of always looking for sources, you know, because sources are hypothetical. Um, um, and so there was kind of a switch uh, in the 1970s from trying to look, look back into before, into, well, we actually have Matthew in front of us, you know, or we have Genesis in front of us. So let's, let's not focus so much on J, the source. Let's focus on how Genesis uses these sources, or let's focus on how Matthew uses um, these particular uh, sources. Um, how has, and the word redact, how has the author of Numbers redacted the story? Um, how has Matthew redacted Mark? Um, so like, uh, let me give you a tame example of this. Uh, in Mark 7, it says, Jesus declared all foods clean. Well, Mark is writing for a non-Jewish audience. Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience. Notice that Matthew doesn't include that statement. Matthew doesn't tell his Jewish audience that all foods are declared clean. That would be an example of redaction criticism. How has Matthew modified Mark in light of its particular inspired purpose? Um, so um, does, uh, is it numbers, uh, kind of modify whether or not um, Moses can see, does, God, God, does Moses see God? Or does God, Moses see the backside uh, of God? Um, the argument being that perhaps the, uh, the, the Eloist, the, the E version um, was uncomfortable with the idea of Moses seeing God and so modified the source uh, to where Moses only sees the backside of God. I hope I'm expressing this, this theory uh, correctly. Let me let me look at the the actual biblical text really quick here. Okay, so I, I noticed that in in Exodus chapter three, we have both a statement in verse eleven that Yahweh used to speak to Moses face to face, and then later in the chapter when Moses asks to see God, in verse twenty he says, "You cannot see my face." So which is it? Did he see him face to face? Or did he not see him face to face and only see his backside? Um, uh, again, I'm not an expert on these these things. Um, one of the one of the okay one of the features in some of these theories is that uh, Exodus six three is it says that that Abraham Isaac and Jacob did not know God by his name Yahweh that the name Yahweh was first revealed to Moses. And so thus in this theory, in Genesis, we can tell the difference between that source, which says God, he was only known by Elohim in before, and then he's known by Yahweh after Moses, that we can distinguish that layer from the part of Genesis where he's called Yahweh. Um, the problem with the, or the difficulty with this theory is in if if there were two layers after Moses, they both say Yahweh. See what I'm saying? The 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 E layer, so to speak, would say we have Elohim until Moses and then Yahweh. But in the J layer, we have Yahweh all the time. And so by the time we get to Exodus 33, you can't use the name of God to tell which is the J layer and which is the E layer on this theory. And so in throughout chapter 33, it's Yahweh. Okay, I'm not going to spend any more time on that. Move on, Shank. Um, narrative criticism I mentioned tonight in the lecture, it's, 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 
it's uh, just simply takes the question of how do you analyze a story and applies it to the, to the Bible. Okay, um, near and far meanings. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we'll do a little bit on this uh, next week when we talk about biblical theology. Is there kind of a first meaning to certain passages and then a, a kind of a spiritual meaning or a fuller sense, a sense is plenier uh, that we find later in scripture. Um, you, we've already talked about this in this course. For example, uh, the, the, a young woman will conceive and give birth to a son. Was there a first meaning uh, in the day of Ahaz and then a second meaning in relation to the virgin conception of Jesus. So um, we've talked about that and, and maybe we'll talk about that. So this is the idea of a census plenier. I think, I think the idea of a census plenier first arose in Roman Catholic circles in the early 1900s, this idea that um, there might be more than one sense uh, to certain Old Testament prophecies, an original sense where you read it in its context, and then a fuller sense that the New Testament um, saw in those same words. Okay, in other words, are there texts that in their fuller sense are messianic? Um, I do agree that the early Jesus movement heard the Spirit speaking to them heavily through the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, these are all uh, Old Testament prophets that the early Christians heard spiritual meanings in relation to Jesus and in relation to the events of their uh, particular day. Okay, critical issues in the prophets. Uh, moving, moving on from the law to the prophets. Uh, well, we already mentioned some of these uh, messianic texts, the question of what was the original meaning? Was there, was there only one meaning that was only about the future? Or was there a first meaning in the day of the prophet and a spiritual meaning um, in, in the time of the New Testament. I tend to see a both and. There was both the original meaning and uh, the spiritual meaning. Um, the question of composition um, is, you know, again, I'm not sure why this is so sensitive. Maybe I could guess a, some of the reasons why this is considered sensitive, but um, do I have, a, um, okay, the idea that there could be uh, I have three parts of Isaiah because the theory was originally kind of like the three, the three Isaiahs, not the three amigos, but the three Isaiahs. Um, this would be Isaiah 1 to 40, Isaiah, I'm sorry, 1 to 39, Isaiah 40 to 55, and then Isaiah 56 to 66. As I survey the book of Isaiah, uh, I would see there as being I, I mean, I, I, I'm fine with a survey of Isaiah that has three parts, but the three parts of Isaiah from a literary standpoint, I would say are uh, chapters one to maybe 35, 34, 35, chapters 36 to 39, and then chapters 40 to 66. So Isaiah one to 34, 35 is primarily from the time of Isaiah. Um, and this is true no matter what you think about the composition history, and I'll explain that term in a second. Um, I think literarily Isaiah 1 to 39 deals with Isaiah's time. Isaiah 36 to 39, I think it is, is a historical bridge. These chapters um, are taken straight from 2 Kings. So those aren't from Isaiah, in my opinion. They are part of, they are a historical bridge inserted to help the reader uh, get from Isaiah's day to chapters 40 through 66, which all relate to the late 500s BC. So like 150 later years after, uh, 200 years after Isaiah. Uh, now, uh, say, take John Oswald. Uh, John Oswald is a conservative evangelical scholar. I had him as a professor at Asbury. He, he taught at uh, Wesley Biblical for a while. So he is clearly a, a conservative evangelical. He would, he would say that the historical Isaiah had a vision of 200 years later. So he believes that the historical Isaiah is the author of chapters 40 to 66, but he would say he's having a vision of a time uh, 200 years later. Um, now, you might notice that Isaiah 40 through 66 never mention Isaiah. 
Isaiah is not mentioned in those chapters. They speak of the late 500s in the present tense. So the Lord speaks to Cyrus, my anointed one. When did Cyrus live? Cyrus lived in the late 500s. So inductively speaking, there is nothing that would lead us in Isaiah's 40 through 66 to identify it with Isaiah. The only reason we do so is because it's packaged uh, with Isaiah. And of course, Isaiah is too long to fit on one scroll. So Isaiah 40 through 66 could very well have been on a separate scroll, even though associated with Isaiah. The main reason why um, this is a, a big issue in some circles is because of uh, the fact that the New Testament uh, and even Jesus um, refer to these passages as, in relation to Isaiah. Um, so I'm not going to go into all those, uh, those questions, um, questions of did God inspire the New Testament within their own frameworks on that? Um, you know, what was their understanding of authorship? Authorship as source uh, or affinity rather than necessarily actual writer. Uh, again, you can, there's plenty of literature out there on all sides of this uh, for you, you to dive into. But I would say from a literary perspective, the first 30, Five chapters of Isaiah go together, 36 through 39 go together as a historical bridge. Chapters 40 through 66 go together um, as, as pro prophecies about the time of exile, uh, post-exile, coming out of exile. Okay, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave that uh, right there. But know that this is a, a theory. And the older scholars used to talk about proto-Isaiah, deutero-Isaiah and Trito Isaiah. Um, Proto Isaiah would have been the material Isaiah 1 to 40. Uh, Deutero or second Isaiah would have referred to chapters 40 to 55. And then Trito or third Isaiah would have referred to chapters 56 to 66. They were not saying that there were three guys who coincidentally happened to be Isaiah. I've heard that. That's, that's not what they're saying. Um, uh, it's just a, a way of dividing it up. Now, the distinction between what they call second and third Isaiah is a question of, of uh, again, temporal time of view. Um, 40 through 55 are just coming out of exile. So there's an optimism to Isaiah 40 through 55, you know, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So it's about going home. It's about, we're going home from Babylon. Yeah, yippee! You know, so there's an optimism about chapters 40 through 55. Chapters 56 to 66 give the impression, man, this place is a dump. We got back to Jerusalem and, man, we need to, this is schmutzy. You know, we need, we need to get these walls back up. Man, it's, there's more of a, um, a tone, as it were, to 56 to 66. It's kind of like, man, we thought this was going to be great, but Man, there's a lot of cleanup to do here on aisle six. Well, there you have it, the three parts of Isaiah. The question of whether Jonah is meant to be taken as historical or whether it's a novella of sorts. Again, people get very angry over, over these sorts of, of, of debates. Um, to me, it's ultimately a question of what is what does it want to be? Um, so for example, I'm, I may make up something silly. Um, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm not an angel. Uh, there, there's a silly illustration. They say someone says, Ken, why aren't you upset? You know, they're saying you're a human being and not an angel. Can you believe they're saying you're a human being and not an angel? Well, I am a human being. I'm not upset by them saying I'm a human being. You, you know, so it's a question of what actually is true about Jonah. It, it, inspiration could go either way, right? I'm sorry. What I mean is a parable is inspired and it's fiction, right? So just because something's fiction doesn't mean it, it is false, right? A novel has all kinds of truth. Isn't it? So the question of whether Jonah is true or not is not dependent on whether it's a novel or not. I, 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 so many of these arguments that people have are they're just not, they don't make sense if you really dig, dig into them. So to me, the question is, well, what is actually true? It's not, and what, what does Jonah want to be? What does Jonah want to be? That's the question. Not, 
not what does the tradition want it to be, but what does Jonah want to be? Um, and I think there are faith-filled people on, on both sides of, of that issue. Uh, obviously, Jesus treats it as an actual event, I, I, I would say. And so, you know, that most for most people, that tips the hand on toward, toward the history. Um, but you could say the same thing about Esther. You could say the same thing about, um, what would be another example, Job. You know, what is, what is the genre of Job? Uh, what is the genre of, of Esther? Are they meant to be taken as historical accounts or are they meant to be taken as novella, novellas anyway? Um, wisdom literature. Um, some of the proverbs seem to borrow from earlier Egyptian proverbs. This doesn't bother me because all truth is God's truth. Um, the Egyptians said some things that were true. And God used those in, in, in the, the Proverbs, no, no big deal. Um, we talked in class about three different theories. The one is that the devil counterfeited, that the devil counterfeited the truth in pagan cultures. You know, the, the thing there is the timeline. The Egyptian literature came first, the Proverbs came later. And so um, then you have Satan somehow knowing that the Proverbs are gonna be written and he counterfeits them before. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me, um, especially since all truth is God's truth. So a bird in hand uh, is better than two in the bush. It's not in the Bible, but it would not be a problem being in the Bible because it's true, right? It's uh, Proverbs aren't, by the way, Proverbs aren't meant to be always true. They are general truths. They are not always truths. Um, they're, they're not promises. They're uh, I have a friend, a scholar, who says they're like bumper stickers. They're true sometimes. Um, they capture a picture of the truth. They're not absolute, always in every circumstance kind of kind of. That's not what the that's not what the genre of a proverb is. A proverb is not a promise. That's not what the genre is. So I'm not saying any, I'm not. You're talking against the proverbs. I'm not talking against the proverbs. It's a question of what is the proverb wanting to be. Um, you know, you have those two verses: answer a fool according to his folly. Don't answer a fool according to his folly. They can't both be absolute statements because they contradict each other. They can both be proverbs with no problem uh, because proverbs capture a picture of the truth. Um, so there is some borrowing from Egyptian literature. The three things that we, we mentioned were devil's counterfeiting, all truth is God's truth, and the other is God meeting them where they're at. Um, and so God's kind of speaking their language and then taking them from, from there. Uh, there's this statement of my friend, Proverbs are like bumper stickers. They're not absolute statements. They capture a truth. Um, uh, I would say that the new Ecclesiastes needs to be read in the light of its last chapter and also uh, in the light of the New Testament. Uh, the final chapter of Ecclesiastes says, here the end of the matter, fear God, keep his commandments. Um, but the New Testament clearly believes in an afterlife. It is not very clear from Ecclesiastes itself uh, that there is life after death. Ecclesi I'm not sure that the author of Ecclesiastes even knows what the answer to that, that there's an afterlife. You know, he says that a, a, a dead dog, I mean, a dead lion, a, a live dog is better than a dead lion. You know, um, this, who knows if the spirit of, of a human goes back to God when they die. Uh, dust thou art and the dust thou shalt return. So um, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, I think, uh, gives us a picture of what life without uh, meaning looks like, what a life without an afterlife looks like. Um, but I do think Ecclesiastes needs to be read in the light of, of the New Testament, where it's very clear there is an afterlife. Um, all right, lastly, apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament. Uh, we mentioned last week what Revelation, the book of Revelation and, a, and an apocalypse is. You have a heavenly being who comes to an important earthly figure, um, usually in a time of distress, although some some would say not necessarily. Um, one of the messages of apocalypse of an apocalypse is that help is on the way. Um, heavenly relief is on the way. God's going to win. Don't worry. Things may not look good. God's going to come through. Um, now, outside of the Bible, we'll, we'll, we'll mention the Bible in a second, but outside of the Bible, apocalyptic literature is generally um, a literary device. So, for example, Nobody thinks that Enoch actually wrote first Enoch or second Enoch or third Enoch. Nobody actually thinks that Abraham actually wrote the apocalypse of Abraham. 
or that Adam actually wrote, you know, the Apocalypse of Adam and, and, and so forth. Um, usually in the Jewish genre, a heaven, an angel comes to an important dead figure from the past. And that important dead figure from the past tells about the future, but it's, it's a literary device. It, let, me, let me give you an example. Let's say that I were to write the apocalypse of John Wesley. Um, and the way you would do that is you would have an angel appear. Now it's, it's me writing it. It's me writing the apocalypse of John Wesley now in the 21st century. But in my apocalypse, an angel would come to John Wesley and John Wesley would, would fall down before the angel and the angel would say, get up. I am a servant of God like you. Worship God, not me. That's part of the form of the, of the, the, the denial, angel denial uh, formula. And then John, then the angel would say to John Wesley, I want to show you things that are soon going to come. Um, there will be uh, seven ages of Methodism. In the early days, and, and basically, since I know history, I will do the first, say, five ages of Methodism spot on. And you'll say, wow, John Wesley saw it. He saw it all coming. You know, he saw the founding of the church in America, and he saw the, the expansion, and he saw the Civil War split, you know, and he saw the holiness movement, you know, and he saw the, the fundamentalist modernist controversy, you know, and then the apocalypse gets to, to me, where I begin to say, and in the sixth age, um, no, I may not, no, let's say I, I, I begin to talk about the day today. And then there will be a great split among the people called Methodists between those who uh, favor abomination and those who stand true to the principles. Now I'm talking about my day. I'm talking about today. I'm talking about what's going on right now. The purpose of that, of the Jewish apocalypses was to talk about their current situation through this literary device of some ancient figure prophesying the future. Now you can tell, you can date an apocalypse really easily because since I don't actually know the future, you know, usually after I get beyond my own time, it goes crazy. It's like, and then there will be fire like the world has never known before. And the Methodists will all, the, those Methodists who, um, who didn't stay true will burn in the sea of a fire, fire, you know, or whatever. Uh, then there'll be a great war, you know, and whatever. But an apocalypse, you can usually date a Jewish apocalypse very easily because, um, the, the, it's where the history goes off. The history of it will be completely accurate in the voice of this ancient figure from the past until you get to the time of writing. So like in the, there's an apocalypse in Enoch called the apocalypse of weeks. And in the apocalypse of weeks, which is in like first Enoch chapter, I don't know, 98, somewhere in there, in the, in the, or maybe it's 110, I can't remember, but in the apocalypse of weeks, the timing is really good until the Maccabean crisis, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, or right before the Maccabean crisis. So this is apocalyptic literature. Um, and it, there were a lot of Jewish literature like that. Now here's where it gets a little, uh, where, where it gets sensitive. And this is the question, is the book of Daniel actually a prophecy from the 500s? Or is the book of Daniel a book from the 100s BC? prophesying about the Maccabean crisis? That's the question that is often raised um, in certain circles about, about the book of Daniel. Well, okay. Um, that's all I want to do in this video. Uh, this has been things that you don't want to talk about <laughs> uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. These are the things you would hear if you were to go to a secular, if you went to the University of India, Indiana University, um, and you learned about the Bible, these are things you would hear there. I feel like um, ministers should have heard of these things, uh, whether you think any of them hold any water uh, or not. And so the deed is done, the dark side of genres in the Old Testament. We'll see you next time on It's YouTube with Ken Shank.